So um, thanks for joining this, uh, this session, um, this final session, and I will share my uh, screen uh, for my short introduction, which I guess is now visible. Um, is it visible, Agatha? Or yes, it is. All good. Yes, okay, thanks. Um, so the final session of the series OA Books Workouts, and I see that Janneke Adema is also in the in this call. Uh, she was the first um, in October already. Um, together now we are here with uh, Whitney uh, Tretje, um, uh, who is an assistant professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and uh, we are talking about her uh, just recently published book. I think it, it is launched just a few weeks ago, just before Christmas, I, I, I think. Um, project is called Cut, Copy and Paste, um, and uh, the subtitle is Fragments from the History of Bookwork. Um, this series is about really, uh, Naya, as the title uh, explains, the workouts. So also uh, the way towards um, uh, the publication of this book. So um, uh, the, the, the challenges, uh, the solutions, uh, the uh, possible innovative ways of uh, doing research and uh, uh, publish uh, about this uh, research. So um, I will give a, a very short introduction to this uh, series and then introduce uh, Whitney, of course, then um, she will explain and talk about her project, um, which is now a live paper uh, book, uh, but also uh, it is in a, uh, a manifold um, uh, installation. Uh, and I uh, have a screenshot, I made it yesterday or two days ago, and I saw with me that you already made some changes uh, when I looked today, um, uh, I guess based on the final uh, final publication, but we hear more about that, I guess, uh, in your talk. Um, so um, this series, uh, we now have the final, the fifth uh, installation, and we were just uh, talking about uh, a, a possible uh, next, uh, a series of events possibly in the fall of this year um, but we are having these talks these very short in interventions of let's say 45 minutes or so and we um, have the recordings available uh, in our YouTube channel of the OA Books uh, Network uh, YouTube channel uh, and we also uh, try to make a so-called like written interview um, uh, afterwards in the next few weeks uh, to come um, and um, yeah, explaining a bit more about the project, but also uh, offering uh, more uh, options to um, yeah, different sources, different resources on the internet uh, or, or other examples. Um, so, uh, as said, this is part, this series of events is part of the Open Access Books Network launched in 2020 in the fall. Um, already, uh, we have, I think, around 400 members. Uh, we do um, uh, several engagements with um, uh, discussions around several topics uh, concerning open access book publishing. Um, uh, and this uh, uh, series of events is part of the Open Access Books Network uh, Humanities Commons page, which you see on the screen. Uh, if you aren't a member, please become one and uh, uh, we uh, uh, can uh, extend our conversations about these, uh, these topics. Um, and what I also uh, always do also in this, uh, in this series is mention, um, because we are talking about practicalities, right? So how to um, uh, use, for instance, uh, uh, use software, or how to um, uh, engage with um, uh, copyright and licensing or uh, funding or other aspects of the, um, the research lifecycle uh, of uh, publishing a book. Um, or I should say life cycle of publishing a book. Um, and I mentioned this open access books toolkit, uh, which is hosted by the OAPEN library uh, platform. Um, and it's a very helpful tool where you can find different answers on all aspects I listed here. So planning and funding, conduct research, considering publishing options, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as said, a very helpful tool, practical tool uh, uh, to find answers on several questions we are discussing also in this series um, of events. Um, so we 
And now moving to uh, the speaker, um, Whitney uh, Trecher. Uh, I already said that uh, she's an assistant professor of English at the University of Transylvania. And uh, <laughs> no, she recently published uh, her book, Cut, Copy, Paste. Uh, on the left side, you see the cover. Um, and on the right side, you see the, the Manifold, uh, which is a publishing software uh, tool. Uh, you see the, the Manifold installation. Um, I will share this link in the chat so you can uh, look for yourself um, uh, when you and you can click the, the links in this uh, in this slide. Um, in this book, um, Whitney uh, journeys to the fringes of the London print trade to uncover maker spaces and collaboratories where paper media were cut up and resembled, reassembled into radical bespoke publications, bringing these long forgotten objects back to life through hand curated digital resources. And she shows, she shows how early experimental book hacks speak to the contemporary conditions of digital scholarship and publishing. Um, and I guess now we will hear about her project um, uh, and also uh, how it became into a final paper version, but also it has a digital uh, uh, version. Um, so I'm really happy to uh, now, um, give you the floor, the virtual floor with me, um, over to you. And I will stop sharing my screen. Great. Thank you so much. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you to the OA Books Network for inviting me. Um, and, and also thank you for listening to this talk in English, because no doubt there are many different native languages represented here. Um, so I am going to talk about uh, Cut, Copy, Paste, which was just released from University of Minnesota Press. Um, and as was just mentioned, it's a hybrid print digital project. But before I show you um, the site and do a little bit of show and tell, I wanted to just set up what this project was about in a little more detail. Um, we've been hearing for two decades now that digital platforms will change how we write history, bringing archive and argument into, into stronger correlation. Um, but we're here now in 2022, and many of the things that have been envisioned for so long are possible and even easy to realize. So we have many facsimiles of early historical documents. We have OCR versions, plain text versions that become data that stuff can be done with of many of these historical documents, millions, in fact of historical documents have undergone this process of digitization and OCRing. We have rich metadata from digitized catalogs and databases, and we have aggregators now like Europeana or what's being done um, here with Library of Congress and sites like that. So uh, cut, copy, paste in this book, I was really trying to take stock of the, the current situation and attempt to take seriously this digital turn and investigate the potential of all of these resources to actually change how we write about the past. Um, and the book's addressing this question from two different angles. So on the one hand, I'm interested in the history of other people who have worked with media and these kind of open source, remixable, adaptive ways. Um, and towards that end, uh, I, I spend time in the book excavating prototypes of radical publishing using fragmented collections of media. So people who cut, copied, and pasted together assemblages um, of different historical materials into new books. So you could go back to ancient Greek and Latin cento poems for the history of this. You could look forward towards the 1980s and the 1990s with zine culture, riot girl zines, um, things like that. All of those, lo the long history of these examples inform the project, but the primary case studies come from 17th century England. And I was really interested in this moment because it's a moment after the advent of print and what we know of as the kind of the print book as we know it today had come into development. We title pages, page numbers, all the kind of mechanisms we're familiar with were, were pretty solidly established by the 17th century. But it's also a moment that's kind of still a little bit pre-modern. It's on the cusp of modernity. We're before the enlightenment and 17th century books still look a little unusual to us. Um, so I'm kind of interested in this moment as one of transition. Um, and so the, the three case studies that I look at are uh, a, a community of women who in the 1630s and 1640s cut apart different Bibles and pasted them into elaborate collages and assemblages. This was known as Little Gidding. I'm interested in a man named Edward Benlows who assembled boutique books of poetry by taking found prints and engravings and illustrations and making each book an individual copy and then giving it to different people and then also selling individualized copies. 
So this kind of interesting relationship between each copy being the same text, but a different assemblage of illustrations. Um, and I look at a figure named John Bagford, who at the end of the 17th century, um, he was trained as a shoemaker. He was a working class person, not educated, but ended up becoming an important bibliographer and one of the founders of the Society of Antiquaries. Um, and he basically saved lots of trash. He saved waste. He saved, um, I, I'm frozen on my screen. I'm not sure if I'm frozen on your screen. There we go. Um, he saved waste, trash, different bits of paper, old manuscripts, like literally stuff that was being thrown away and created these really remarkable assemblages that are now mostly at the British Library, these huge scrapbooks just stuffed with all this waste. And he, my argument is he was assembling them into kind of creative histories that tell the story of the history of printing. So before, before network digital technologies, before the stuff we're used to now, a project like this would have been difficult to realize because you really have to see these historical materials in order to understand the stuff that I'm talking about. I just described the books to you, but it's gonna be a lot clearer when I show you a picture in a minute. And if I want to really get my readers to appreciate the creative interventions of these people, then I need, I need to really be able to show them the books. Um, of course, at the same time, such a project would face significant obstacles on the path to publication. The precarious economics of scholarly publishing. This is a very serious problem in the US context, especially with a book being required for, for my tenure and for most assistant professors to get tenure. Um, we all have to publish books, but there are fewer pathways to publishing books. Um, as a result, the, the economics of scholarly publishing don't actually cheaply accommodate these kind of image rich, data rich projects, right? And even if you were able to find a publisher who's willing to take risks on a very design heavy book, which there are a few right now, it would likely require a, a subvention to defray the high cost of publishing. And I've heard everything from $5,000 to $15,000 as a, as a subvention for just a couple of color images. Um, with the spread of the web and personal computing in the 90s, of course, though, it became possible for scholars to begin to recuperate these understudied materials. And this released a spate of these kind of small scale digital projects. And in some ways, a lot of people in digital humanities, which is one of my fields, have been looking back and, and recognizing that those projects did a lot of good work, but they didn't survive. They haven't survived. They haven't fundamentally transformed the canon. In literary studies, for instance, we still tend to teach an Anglo-centric white, heteronormative patriarchal canon, right? So, so why is it that these digital projects of the 90s didn't actually do the transformative work that they promised is, is a kind of question that's being asked right now, especially by um, Amy Earhart who's done a lot of really great work on this. Um, and, and I'm interested in that question, but I also throughout this project have kind of remained stubbornly committed to that ideal of these early digital projects that actually digital methods of recovery, rereading, adaptation, remix, just the simple capability of embedding digital materials into a text is, is actually can be transformative. In fact, doing that work is more vital and urgent than ever. So when discussing the design of, of these little known 17th century objects, and using digital tools to do that, actually the digital tools can become transformative um, again. So that brings me to the second angle from which the project addresses uh, the future of publishing that's in practice, which I'm going to show you here, um, stitched into the fabric of the book as it exists on, man on the Manifold platform are a variety of resources. I'm just gonna show you a few, so I'll just give you a sense here verbally. Um, there's data, there's different images, there's full editions. Um, I'm frozen again, but hopefully, there we go. Yeah, you, um, we, we still can hear you, so yeah. Okay, great. Um, maps, collation formulas, book lists, there's a social network of a publisher, all kinds of things, right? So. And all of these assets, most of them can be downloaded and used for your own purposes. Some of them are like links to GitHub pages where you can download the data and work with it for your own purposes. Um, so collectively, I've been thinking about these resources as um, what Catherine Bode describes as a digital scholarly edition of a literary system, right? So it's a new kind of making an edition that produces a kind of literary system that can be deployed for different research purposes. Um, 
So it's a, it's a kind of virtual reading room is, is another way of thinking about it. So by assembling, by assembling all these materials from marginal neglected practices into this virtual reading room, um, I'm trying to show that we can actually do the work of decentering the histories that I just described as remaining so entrenched. And we can do it by a different form of publishing and it actually requires a different form of publishing to do it. So I'm gonna show you now what I'm talking about and demo a little bit of, of Manifold. So, there we go, sharing screen. Um, so the book exists in print, um, but the, the same text as the print book exists as an ebook, and then that ebook has also like the, the XML from the ebook has been used to produce this staging on Manifold. Um, and you can read the whole thing online then. So I'm just gonna scroll down and show you the table of contents. But before that, I'll mention, since I know that people are interested here in peer review and kind of iterative publishing, it's really important to me. And in fact, in the introduction, I lay out a set of principles of what is necessary for me in this form of digital publishing, principles and ethics basically, which include things like embracing plural approaches to form and formats, um, challenging patriarchal whitewash narratives about history using digital resources, publishing, pu publicly sharing and maintaining on the open web any research outputs, right? So, so openness is at the core of the principles and ethics of this project. And towards that end, um, I had used Manifold earlier in 2019 to stage a, a draft chapter of my second chapter. And this was a somewhat problematic chapter for me. So I thought it'd be really good to, to get some extra readers, um, extra eyeballs on it because Edward Benlows is a, a little known figure and it'd be really great to see what other early modernists think about the materials um, that I was bringing forward. And so I, I, had, um, I worked with Terrence Smyer, who's an editor uh, with Manifold through University of Minnesota Press, really amazingly, he helped me embed all these images. Um, and staged the text and worked very carefully with me. And then I sent out emails to a lot of people who I thought might be interested in it and got a lot of feedback. Um, so people can basically go highlight, um, you can highlight, uh, annotate and you know write, write comments on it. Um, and it was really actually super helpful. The highlighting seems like a silly feature, but it was actually really, really helpful to see what people thought was important because it was not always what I thought was important. Um, and it also allowed me to stage these resources and kind of test out the platform a little bit, which I'll show you now. So, so that was the drafting in uh, 2019, which really helped me um, work through the project and get, get some more information about new parts of the project out there. Um, okay, so once I had gotten kind of a sense of what Manifold could do, I then moved on to... Um, finishing the print book. And I was writing it as a print book while trying to keep in mind the various resources that are possible and capabilities of Manifold. So basically, I don't know if others have worked with Manifold here, but um, it's a platform, it's a publishing platform where you can upload assets um, that include like data, images, interactive resources, and you can organize those assets into resource collections. So for instance, I was interested in this publisher, Humphrey Mosley, um, he's kind of peripheral in the actual book project, but because of the research that I was doing on Humphrey Mosley with in collaboration with an undergraduate student um, here at Penn, we, um, we ended up with like all this data about Humphrey Mosley that was kind of the background, you know, you know, it's like the book is the tip of the iceberg always, you have all this research data underneath the thing that actually shows up in the written work. Well, all that research data, I thought this has to, somebody else is going to find this really useful, right? So, so I made a resource collection for Humphrey Mosley materials where you can kind of explore the graphs that we were, um, that we were um, making, um, but also do other things with it. So for instance, um, if we scroll down, you can see other resources here, other little interactive graphs um, and, and images that relate to, for instance, this is um, the gift of a title page, a title page that shows that um, Edward Benlow's gifted this book to his publisher, Humphrey Mosley. 
Um, every asset is, uh, I wrote out the descriptions for all these things and it uh, has all these kind of rights attached to it, whether you can download it or not, where it's from. So pretty robust um, metadata. Um, thankfully attached to all this stuff. And I will say that um, Terrence and University of Minnesota Press was really great on working with me on copyright on all of these things. We very carefully went through every asset in the project um, to ensure that it was um, legally usable. And then, you know, we're able, I was able to push back on a few things as well, which was really great. Um, okay, so the, the manifold itself, so you wanna read the book, you kind of scroll down, let's just go straight into, you can go straight into any one of the texts here and begin reading. So I just want to show you a few things that ways that I used Manifold. Um, so one of them was that you can leverage the platform to enrich the text with more images and evidence than you can actually show in the printed book. This is the iceberg problem of all the data underneath any given thing, right? So for instance, when I'm talking about the bindings um, of, of a, a being done at Little Gidding, you know, I can't, it's really tedious in the text to go over every like binding that's that they were doing, but it's actually a really important part of the argument because for a long time, Little Gidding was thought to do a certain type of binding. And in fact, in many libraries, they still catalog books as Little Gidding books when they're not getting into the weeds here a little bit, but the point is it's really important to be able to show that they are actually producing leather and velvet binding. So you produce a resource um, collection. I annotate it right on the piece of the text that describes this. And I can show you images that are open access images from libraries like the Folger, which has a really, really great rights and reuse policy, as well as my own images from libraries, as well as images from other scholars. So I was working with a network of little getting scholars and saying, hey, can you share your images of this book that you got to see at the Royal Library? I'll give you the books I saw at Oxford. We're sharing images. And um, they, they um, great, I'm very grateful that they gave me permission to use um, the images that they shared with me. So you can kind of leverage it to produce um, leverage manifold to produce more evidence. But another another way is when I'm describing the books, you can actually just like pop in and see what I'm describing, even if I'm not talking about the book. So here I'm describing um, Bagford's collections. Super useful when I'm saying he's collecting a bunch of papers to be able to just see my research images. Um, I literally have dozens and dozens of Bagford images in here. I would have put hundreds in if I didn't think it would overwhelm the reader, frankly. Um, and this is a problem with doing this kind of net worked text, right? You have to you have to kind of create a boundedness even as you open new pathways for people to explore, um, which is another way that um, that I was trying to uh, that I was using manifold. So, for instance, here are all the ways that Benlow's was disparaged by readers in the 18th and 19th century. And I have some quotes and the typical ways that we've developed in print publishing to cite something. But if you want to actually see exactly what I'm citing, you can just pop off to the Internet Archive or Happy Trust version of that thing right to the page that I'm talking about and, and follow the, the text out into the archive itself. Um, now, sometimes that archive is not just kind of the stuff that I was reading, but it becomes part of the argument, like I'm following a trail of reuse across different books. Um, and when that happens, so as in this little getting chapter, um, I was really interested in how these two prints were getting reused across a series of books. Um, I created little digital editions that you can then you can then link uh, you can then open as interactive resources. So this is a digital network of four little getting harmonies that I produced. You can visit it at digital book history backslash little getting, um, but it's also embedded here as a uh, a resource that you can use to begin exploring the harmonies yourself and follow the trails of reuse. And I've tried to produce the links here in such a way that as you're reading, you know, I'm talking about the Pentateuch concordance, you can kind of plug right into the Pentateuch concordance, Oop, a broken thing, I always find this, this is a problem with digital things, um, and plug right in and, and keep moving. Um, so again, Act of Apostolorum, pop right into the digital edition, or you can just open it up and start exploring for yourself the digital edition. Now, I saw the digital edition and the text as being kind of two parts of what I was doing. So there's, there's the print book, there's the digital book that's the same as the print book, but enriched with these resources. And then there's the digital editions that I produced in a constellation around the book. 
And these digital editions, somebody might use them to teach, somebody might come to the project just to see these and then plug into the, the book, right? So, so there's multiple ways that you can think about these things hanging together and interacting that, that, and again, this was the goal here, enable more research. So I think in history, especially, we tend to think of these are my research materials, like I found this thing and we keep a kind of closed mindset produce the historical narrative, and then treat that as the, as, as the object. And I was trying to kind of open up, crack open those attitudes a little bit and say, all these research materials are available. Here's how I was thinking about it. Other things can be seen in them and be more um, collaborative about it. And this comes from a feminist ethos of um, collaboration and collectivity that I talk about in the introduction. Um, and I'll just share like one, one more instance here. Um, and then we can talk a little bit, but um, so the other thing that was really important was data set. So for instance, when we were looking at books, um, looking at books uh, that, that um, have a ton of fragments, one of the things that I was doing with my research assistants is tracing the sources and those sources actually show up. I'll show you the actual data set here. Um, those sources can be traced in all kinds of ways. And my research assistants and I were working um, using these big spreadsheets, basically, trying to figure out where each fragment came from. And the spreadsheets were hosted on Google Drive. And so we just made those Google spreadsheets open and they're now data sets that you can look at or download for yourself, or you can go directly to the GitHub page and download any of the materials that I've made. Um, they all have a GitHub repo um, attached to them and and um, and you can use it or you can just go right into the digital edition if you're not that interested in kind of working with the data itself and explore the digital edition as an interactive resource. Um, next level, I would love these interactive resources to be embedded the way that the images are embedded in the text and not just annotating the text. Um, small things like that. Um, it can be kind of tricky to work with iframes and things like that. But on the whole, and we, I'm happy to take questions about that, but on the whole, um, the goal here was really to transform how we can work with historical materials. And I think that it's partially succeeded, it's partially succeeded in doing that because it's, these books have not been, um, these books have not been studied that much before. And I think they're now available for study uh, in a way that they they wouldn't have been. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to, I'll, I'll stop there because I know we've, it's a short intervention here and I'm happy to, to take questions or um, talk more about any aspect of this. So thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Whitney. And um, I'm, I'm just thinking, this, this, this looks so cool. And I'm, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed uh, uh, about um, many things, um, but, um, regarding the time, so we have 50 more minutes to uh, to talk about your project, and uh, I already said in the chat. So if uh, any of the participants have have any questions, please ask them now, and so we will address these in the in the talk. Um, and even if you want to put on your video and ask the question yourself, that's also fine. Um, uh, I. So one thing is, um, so you did an, had the first chapter, this draft chapter. Um, I, I, I think it was chapter one uh, of the book, but um, and and it was already there for I think in 2019, 2020. You published this on on, on Manifold. Um, when you uh, engage with with the publisher, with Minnesota University Press, was this already part of the project towards the 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 book? So did they already? Sort of were involved in that you were and are using Manifold as a first sort of um, route of publication? That's a really um, great question. So, uh, and actually one that I haven't gotten, it's I haven't gotten that question before, and it makes me think a little differently about this. So, um, I, so typically, you know, someone, assistant professor in the US would write a manuscript and then submit it for publication. And then it kind of goes through the process, right? Um, and with this, I submitted a proposal first. And that was really important because I submitted a proposal specifically knowing that I wanted to work with Manifold. And I submitted it to Minnesota because I knew that they were doing really cool things with Manifold. So 
Um, I knew I needed to work with a publisher who was really good at the digital stuff. And this was back in maybe um, like 2015 or 2016 when I submitted it. So um, at that point, I think Minnesota was like pretty much the only publisher doing that. Since then, I think Stanford has done some things like other yep. other places are starting to do some things. Right. So um, and at that point, people were like, well, you can do WordPress or Scalar. And Manifold offered this possibility of me doing my own thing on separate servers and then kind of like plugging and linking it in. So that's why I really wanted to work with them. So I submitted a proposal and, and that was important because it meant that they were invested in the project early mm -hmm. on. And I was able to work with Terrence Smyer. So I like had access to their editors um, and the editor, Doug Armato, who I was working with on the print text was also really like supportive of all that stuff. At the same time, like he emphasized, and I think this was really good advice, like write it as a print book. So, you know, if you think about it as just a set of digital resources, then the project becomes just- you know, two, like, yeah. yeah, exactly. It just- expands. It can be anything, right? Yeah, 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 you, yeah, you're not doing anything. So so the print book, I mean, this was really important for me because I'm, I'm a book historian. I'm interested in books. I'm interested in what books can do. and in the in the introduction in fact i talk about book work like the work that books do right. even when you work on different platforms and forms and formats it remains absolutely crucial to the scholarly enterprise like a book can be a many di many different things but the concept of the book as this thing the boundaries that's like yeah. bringing yeah bounded thing that brings together dispersed materials into like a cohesive kernel that has some kind of like timeline not necessarily the publishing date like that's starting to disappear right mm -hmm. but like the the over the course of three to five years right cut copy paste is a thing and it'll probably have an end you know a trail off and an end life where people see it not as useful the resources start to decay whatever right and that's all fine that's all part of the natural publishing process so so the proposal was really important and and uh having publishers who are invested in the projects is re was really important to me too yeah and i can i can imagine that because you are so you have shown had manifold and and briefly shown also that the data uh behind had the graphs the the let's say the raw data is is in github um and then you have uh the, the manuscript itself the, the so you have many um platforms or that or or instances you need to sort of uh, uh track um was that so first question I, I guess that can be complicated so maybe you can tell a, a bit more about that and the other thing is it, it is also time consuming extra time possibly uh how do you deal with that yeah and I, I talk about this a little in the introduction as well because you know on the one hand I, I'm, I'm kind of putting forward a manifesto for this as a future of publishing but mm -hmm. I'm also recognizing a great amount of time and investment, like literal investment of resources. And I have a, a, a research job in the United States. Like I have a pretty good job compared to a lot of other jobs, frankly. And, and as a result, have access to research funds. And that, that I'm unabashedly like honest about, that was really important um, because that enabled me to digitize some of the books, get the images that I needed, uh, travel to libraries and and all that kind of stuff. So it does require like a level of support, like institutional support to do that kind of work. And I also, um, when I was hired in this job, I wrote, I, ha I like kind of negotiated into the contract that the digital, um, the digital stuff would, would count as much mm -hmm. um, in, 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 principle it would in practice i've ended up you know i wrote a book and also made a lot of digital editions and that's the digital editions alone were like a, as much as as a book writing a book i think so without the the help of the research assistants and things like that i i very frankly admit it would not have would not have been possible so i think this is a a struggle moving forward especially given the precarity that many institutions are facing is how to find ways of supporting this stuff and i don't just mean supporting it in terms of sustainability but like supporting it at the beginning of the research process like there's a lot of research going on about repositories like retaining the materials all that kind of stuff there's less emphasis being put on the fact that scholars need to be funded in order in order to like do do this kind of work which i think is is very important i mean i think it's the future of our our discipline um um yeah so um, having the research assistance and, and access to funding was really important. And, and we need more funding, re funding is like funding sources that provide that kind of material. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the chat. So there's a, there's, there are two, two short questions by Janneke. 
Um, in your experience, after having used Manifold, how easy do you think it is to work with uh, uh, with scholars that are not uh, that digital, digitally literate? Do you see challenges there? And the other question is, on the other hand, with the move towards more user-friendly platforms such as Manifold, there might be less options for bespoke elements or unique features. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I love that question, Janneke, and thank you. Um, your work is such an inspiration to me always, um, as you know. So, and and your work on all this in experimental cool stuff, which I've also done with um, zines like Thresholds and things like that. And we, sh we share that interest. And, and it's, you know, this is such a struggle because, um, I've, I've made many bespoke digital things in, in my career that speak to, you know, form matching argument and things like that. Um, and in, in the end, I wanted to produce a book that would point off towards those resources as they were hosted on my own server, but retain the kind of um, core of a, a kind of publisher backed book that had the print like a possibility of the print component even as the print is not the same at all as the digital and the print is is uh, you know very part of what i wanted to produce was an object a print object that was a little bit impoverished compared to the digital so that i wanted to kind of force people um on onto the manifold site so yeah that's always a struggle but i think that what's what so I'll just say that that looking at all these experimental publishers in the 17th century, working with some of it myself, all that energy was like informing how I was thinking about the parts hanging together. But in the end, it was important to have something more user friendly. Um, Manifold itself is is very user friendly. I think that's one of the reasons why it will be more widely taken up than something like Scalar has been, because it's a really like dead simple concept. It's assets that can be organized into resource collections that can be annotated onto a text. Um, now, what I would love to see is some some publisher I do think could you can you can basically in, download and and install your own instance of manifold right so some publisher could in theory sorry I just spilled water um, could in theory actually take manifold and and use it towards more experimental purposes than a traditional publisher would, right? Um, so I think that's an exciting possibility. Now, I do think a few elements need to be there. Like you need to be able to actually like embed interactive resources in the text. Right now you can only embed the images. University of Minnesota's workflow is such that I could only embed the images that are in the print book and then everything else had to be a digital resource asset. Okay. Um, but if you could embed interactive resources, like when I'm talking about the social network and you could just embed the social network and somebody could play with it instead of having to click off two or three times, that would be like super transformative next level for Manifold and would enable a lot more experimental uses. Um, but yeah, great question. Uh, and another question by Marcelo Zanon. Um, I'm not sure I captured well how or if Manifold works with Git, GitHub, uh, or if there are in fact two separate projects. Um, I guess there are, there are two separate project spaces. Um, yes, um, two separate things. So, so basically um, GitHub I'm using as a set of repositories for the digital tools and the data set. So when I have a data set of the fragment sources, I would um, upload it to GitHub as like a CSV file that somebody could download. When I produced a website, I would upload the code to GitHub. So GitHub's where all the like back end stuff of the more experimental stuff, digital edition stuff that I was making on my own is being hosted. So that's the, op the so I'm using it as a way of making open, following this principle of openness, making open my own like code, all the stuff, right? Um, that's on GitHub. So GitHub, I just link to through Manifold. So to do that, Manifold has like, you can have like links, images, videos. And I, I did a couple of videos too, which was really fun because you can like show the books being paged and things like that. Um, videos, interactive resources, and the GitHub repositories are embedded in the Manifold text as links. So in the text, I might say something like, you know, if you want to explore the data set more, 
you know, you can on Manifold click the link available here and there you can kind of click it and bounce off to the GitHub page. Um, very few people will probably be interested in those data sets, but who knows? I think there's a lot there that's, um, you know, other researchers will find interesting or for, for teaching with, um, actually, we need more data sets to teach with. So that's another possibility. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, so, and uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, so you now have a paper version and you have this online edition. Um, also with the possibility to make annotations, uh, others can, can I guess, still uh, uh, add stuff to it, um, if you allow. Um, first, will you allow it? And uh, if you do, how do you foresee that, will there be, how do you uh, deal with, let's say, like a second version or another version of the, of the, of the book? Um, will you still engage with the project for a longer period of time? Yeah, that's a really good Because it, 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 um, the, the tools also uh, offer this solution to, to engage for a longer time with this, with this topic instead of uh, possibly in a more traditional uh, um, way of publishing. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's my, it would be my hope and my, it's my dream that somebody would, you know, readers would read the digital version and highlight and annotate as they did on, on the draft. And in that way, it becomes this kind of living document after its publication, right? Um, that where I can start to see some, some sense of a reader response. Um, and, and I'm going to do my best to encourage readers towards the digital edition to do just that. And I, I do in the introduction as well. Um, so yeah, it will have this life, but again, it's, it's more of like, instead of thinking of it as this endless like thing that mm -hmm. goes on and on, it's more that the single publishing event has become like a constellation of events that has this kind of like curve of, uh, over a timeline. And, you know, over the next year or two years, you know, readers may find this work and annotate it. I would love if people, part, part of the reason I made, I, I really wanted the open access edition is because books are incredibly expensive, as we know, hundreds of dollars here. Many libraries are not buying books anymore, um, university libraries. And the best way to get your book taught is to have it available for, for people to just give a put drop a link on a syllabus, right? So I would love if somebody would want to teach the book and then have their students annotate it, right? So thinking of different layers of readers from like colleagues who are expert in the really boring minutia of my argument to like, you know, amateur readers who might just be coming to these ideas for the first time and then watch that kind of that, that long tail of interaction. That would be the dream and what I what I hope for. I mean, we'll see what happens, right? I mean, we're still trying to get more people to read things online and and um, engage with materials online. So I think that's actually it's, you know, it's the 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 production side of things, we have robust tools, we've got great mm -hmm. networks of individuals interested in this stuff, we have scholars interested in this stuff. Um, the reader side is kind of where a lot of there's, there's a little bit like less take up because people are so set in their ways of how they engage with their own research materials that to, to make that transition will be slow as younger and emerging scholars, you know, work in these kind of by their nature, digital environments more naturally and become accustomed to them as like early on in their career. Yeah. And um, um, it, it, it's almost time, but I, um, so in the previous sessions, we um, uh, talked about this as well. So had uh, doing innovative stuff uh, that takes uh, usually more time uh, because it's the first time you do it or uh, you, have, you have other uh, motivations to do it differently. Um, and that takes time, um, but as you said in the in the in the first part of your talk, had um, uh, had the book, and you need a book to have uh, had to, for your career, for tenure, etc., etc. Um, based on the traditional ways of publishing, uh, it should be at a university press or a renowned press in a paper version, etc., etc. Um, do you have any sense of how your colleagues at university, for instance, or in your university system, uh, recognize these sort of new, uh, this, this digital version? Uh, did you had already any comments about it? Or um, how do you foresee, uh, have we need changes in the recognition and rewarding structures, I think, uh, in order to, to motivate uh, others to, to do it like this as well? Um, what are your thoughts about about that? What what do we need on on, on that level? 
Yeah, such a good question. Um, yeah, my colleagues are very interested in this material, which is so encouraging. They're very interested in these processes. I was hired in digital humanities, so there's some expectation I'll be doing this kind of work. Um, but there's still a lot of confusion. Like when I went up for review, I guess a year or two ago, um, you know, a lot of excitement, but also a lot of like, wait, what? Like, what? how did you, yeah. Yeah, what are you doing? How did you make yeah. that? So, you know, uh, uh, shouldn't you be in software, which is not true at all. Like I could never be a software engineer, right? So it's, you know, that that kind of like educating um, colleagues is a big part of, of, of what I, you know, do a lot of, and and we, we do need more of that advocacy, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of hope. And I actually think we've kind of turned a corner here. So um, there's people like me who are hired to do this kind of stuff. Um, Ryan Cordell's another example of someone, a colleague of mine who's who's gotten tenure and had a really fabulous career based on a lot of digital work and collaborations with computer scientists. Um, and I think that actually, in especially in the US context, looking to our social scientists and STEM colleagues for how they're using OA publishing mm -hmm. and things like that, like we're in the humanities here, we're just starting to think about this stuff and the possibilities. Um, and, and thinking about the lab model, collaboration, like everyone's really on board with this stuff now. It's just a matter of like, doing it which takes, no, a, doing takes it. A, a shift right and that shift is happening as as we speak which and and you know the networks like this right so yeah I creating, think, I think creating leading there. examples and yeah, yeah exactly yeah yeah okay uh final call to the participants if you any questions now is your time um otherwise we will close the session um 10 more seconds thank you so much um, to everyone for coming yeah um so i see i see no questions but i guess we can extend uh, the conversation on the humanities commons uh, platform as well so um to all participants thanks for showing up asking questions thanks whitney for your talk uh, your fabulous talk about your project um, and with that being said, so thank you very much for this 45 minutes. Um, and, uh, and I hope to see you soon somewhere, uh, hopefully on the Humanities Commons platform, uh, where we can uh, continue the discussion and the conversation about all these fascinating projects. So thank you very much. Have a good day, um, morning, evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, see you soon. Yaro, just just uh, five seconds from the open access books network because this is the last of the series this is the last episode so a huge huge thank you from uh, the open access books network to you for hosting the series it was absolutely fantastic we had wonderful speakers and thank you for making this happen thanks again thank you everyone okay. thank goodbye you. <laughs> bye 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 bye